With the Battle of Hastings now won, though at a considerable cost, William had to move quickly to try to control England before some of the noble beat him to the prize. The Battle of Hastings had resulted in the deaths not only of Harold, but also his two brothers Griff and Leofwine, as well as many other nobles, and with the earlier battle at Stamford Bridge removing some of the other potential claimants to the throne, William hoped he would be swiftly proclaimed king. Just in case this wasn't so, he'd bring as much of his army as possible with him to London. Immediately following the defeat of the English forces at Hastings, however, the Witan decided to elect young Edgar Aethling as king. Edgar was the grandson of an earlier king, King Edmund Ironside. Edgar could gather enough additional support from the earls of Northumbria and Mercia, and the still living form of Morcar and Edwin, he might just hang on to the throne. Although these nobles had lost troops in the early battles of Fulford and Stamford Bridge, they still commanded a substantial number of troops, possibly enough to defeat William's also depleted force. Edgar, however, didn't have to rely wholly upon the northern nobles for support. Many of the troops who had retreated in the night from the Battle of Hastings made it the relatively short distance to London, they combined with other locally raised troops that didn't assemble in time for the Battle of Hastings. William now approached London from the south, having secured Kent on his way towards London. Even in 1066, the city of London was a major prize, a major trading centre for England both internally and with the continent. London's position was far enough away from the coast to be fairly safe from Viking raids, and yet had a very major river which led to the sea. The river also enabled London to be a major port and shipbuilder, adding to its economic value. The St. John River Thames now presented William with a problem as he approached London. The river was so wide there were few bridges that could cross it. In the wide part of the river where William was now approaching, the crossing point was London Bridge. Fortunately for William, the other end of the bridge was held in some considerable force, which, given the narrow confines of the bridge, made it suicidal to have attempted to force his way across such a long bridge. William then looted Southwark on the southern end of the bridge and marched west to find an easier location to cross the river. William's march eventually took him another 50 miles through Wallingford, where he crossed the river, and marching back down the north side of the river, he arrived at Westminster. However, this time, Edwin Morcar decided not to support Edgar, thinking that William's force might just be enough to hold Wessex, but it wouldn't be possible for William to extend his rule over Mercia and Northumbria, so he looked to keep their forces intact in case they needed to fight either William or some other foe at a later date. So with the armed forces of the northern earls now out of the picture, William was secure on the north bank of the river, he decided to use a combination of small-scale fighting, bribes to nobles and priests, alongside threats to devastate the city of London if it resisted. This combination eventually led to the decision to crown William King of England at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day 1066, two and a half months after his victory at Hastings. However, William wasn't entirely convinced of his new subjects' loyalty, so to ensure that the people of England weren't about to change their mind about William being king as soon as his back was turned, William took hostages, including the elected but uncrowned King Edgar, along with Morcar and Edwin, back to Normandy in March 1067. When William left for Normandy, he left two of his trusted courtiers, Odo of Bayeux, now Earl of Kent, and William Fitz Osborne, now Earl of Hereford, in charge of England. Various knights that he promised land to were now tasked with building castles on the new land and gardening against any potential threats, both internal and external. However, whilst the southeast of England was now firmly under William's control, the same couldn't be said for the rest of England. Soon there was a rebellion at, in the west at Exeter, which put down after an 18 day siege. More seriously, Edwin and Morcar, who left Normandy in 1068, returned to England, attempted to raise a rebellion in Mercia, even re reached as far as Warwick with their troops. But then they chickened out of the fight and pledged loyalty to William. A little later, trouble was brewing in Northumbria, with two new ruling earls being murdered in quick succession, and the third one decided that Edgar Aethling should be King of England rather than William. William then, in the summer of 1068, marched his army into Northumbria. As a result, most of the leading rebels, including Edgar, fled to Scotland. However, with William's troops now in Northumbria, rebellions broke out in several other places all over England. 
So, once more, William either personally led his troops to suppress the rebellions or sent trusted Norman knights to see that revolts were put down. In 1069, however, with substantial support from the Danes, who a few years earlier had been able to defeat Harold Hardrada, rebels arose again in Northumbria and took the city of York. As William again marched his troops into Northumbria, the rebels again withdrew and didn't fight a pitched battle. At this point, William decided that enough was enough and decided to take some drastic measures. Firstly, he bribed the Danes to return home, which they duly did. William then split his army into smaller groups and proceeded to carry out what was known as the Harrowing of the North. Since the rebels wouldn't fight him, he decided to rue their support by laying waste to the farms and villages throughout a substantial area in a scorched earth policy. The harrowing certainly resulted in many thousands of people in Northumbria dying from starvation. It was decades before Northumbria recovered anything like the economic force it was before the harrowing. Drastic action probably made other areas more reluctant to engage in rebellion, though Harrowed the Wake did lead a short-lived rebellion in marshlands around Ely. The last revolt against William was in 1075, known as the Revolt of the Earls, but again it was unsuccessful. What all these revolts, sieges and battles tell us about the reign of William was that far from the Battle of Hastings, resulting in William being the undisputed ruler of England, purely marked a stepping stone on the road to the Norman conquest of England. It's almost certain that England had a powerful leader who all the various factions could respect and rally around, and William's victory at Hastings had only been a temporary one. Instead, vested interests, greed, petty rivalries, and the opposition to William was never truly united. As a result, William could slowly exert his control over the kingdom. It's probably only his heirs that could really think of themselves secure on the throne of England.